It was a journey that was full of potential, and it started in this humble home in El Paso. It continued all the way to Hollywood, under the lights and marquees of the Sunset Strip, a journey that ended on the cusp of stardom. If he was just allowed to do it a little bit longer, he would have been up there with the best of them. He would have become a, he would have become a legend. The saddest thing is, I don't. I, I think he was just starting to really develop. We sold a TV show at Sony, and they were just thrilled. And uh, he died a week later. Well, there's probably a parallel universe where we did go off on that journey, right? You know. At the Comedy Store in West Hollywood, one of the most revered comedy clubs in the country, the walls are covered with the names of the comics who have contributed to the club's legendary status. Comics who were past, who were deemed worthy of being a permanent part of the club. And right above the doorway to the main room, surrounded by some of the biggest names in comedy, you'll see his name, Freddy Soto. All he wanted to do was make people laugh. That was his whole goal in life. Cory Como Soto met her future husband at the Comedy Store in 1996 when she was working at the club and Freddie was an up and coming comic. This was our home. We lived in that house right up the hill right there. And this is where we grew up. This is, this is where we fell in love. This is where there was not one job in this entire building that both of us didn't have. And it's where I feel him as he wanted to be. Is there still the picture of Freddie up here? Yes, yeah, you were up there. It's June 22nd. It's what would have been Freddie Soto's 49th birthday. So um, tonight is Freddie's birthday, and so I'm going to be going around interviewing people to get Freddie's story. Corey is combing the halls of the comedy store collecting stories about her late husband as part of a future podcast project. Do you have a Freddy story? Uh, I have plenty of Freddy stories. I started here in 2000, and the, the day I started here, Freddy was so nice to me simply because my name was Freddy. And I saw him go on stage, and I never saw somebody be so comfortable, so natural, and so decent to people when he got off stage. And I go, that's the kind of man I want to be. And I go, that is just such a decent human being. Freddy was a master of the original room. Like, I didn't know how to build it. Mm -hmm. And Freddie was a master of that. Like he could take a dead room and just come out and be like, hey, how's it going? Yeah. And like set up the stage a little bit. And he's like, I got to tie my shoe. Oh, my back. I'm getting older, bro. You know, you're getting old when you wake up. My dad used to make noises when he got out of bed. Ah! And he goes, now I'm making those noises. And he'd start building it and start building it. And then nine minutes into a set, the audience is roaring and he's going, God damn it! Like that. And the place is like, the walls are shaking. I remember I went to... <laughs> I remember I went to, you know, Juarez. That's where I went to cross, you know what I mean? Juarez. It's right in El Paso, Texas, man. And uh, you can go over there and you can get this toy, man, all right? It's a little miniature shoebox. And when, what you do is when you open it, there's a little spider that comes out and a little nail comes out of his mouth. And when you open it fast enough, it goes right through your knuckle. Yeah, this is a fucking toy, man, all right? People get this shit on Christmas and shit like that, you know? They like, hear dad, open this, man, it'll scare you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be scared of you and your little cagada. <laughs> Chinga. Oh, you're crazy, me. <laughs> I don't get scared, cabrón, all right? You're gonna scare, oh, let me, I'm scared. I'm peeing on my toes. I don't know what to do. He has a little cagada. Let me see how scary you are, pendejo. Cabron! 
What's wrong with you, goddammit? Look at my finger! Here, he's uh, 15 years old. Ana Soto is Freddy's mother. And I had made a cake, and he's he's eating the the, fr- uh, the cake mix there. At her home in West Central El Paso, she tells me about how Freddy was not like the other kids. If we'd go on vacation, he'd make friends with whoever was in the elevator, whoever was in the swimming pool. It didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter to him. He, he made friends with everybody and got along with everybody. When do you first start going in? Boy, this, this kid is funny. He's different. You know, when do you start? When does that first come into, uh, into focus? Well, let me tell you, he, I used to invite my friends over, and uh, they would say, uh, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I want to. I want to be a. I want to be a comedian. I would call him to dinner. I would say, "Freddy, dinner's ready. Freddy's dinner's ready." He would not come. What's Freddy doing? Well, he had closed the door to his room. I would open the door, and he would be making faces in front of the mirror. What are you doing? He goes, oh, "I'm just making faces in front of the mirror." I go, "Why? <laughs> They're just, just funny faces, Mom. You know." And those funny faces came out in his uh, routines. Anna says Freddie's fascination with show business is what led him to Hollywood. At the age of 19, he moved to Los Angeles and enrolled in film school. He started to work with other creative minds, making films like this one. We got thrown together into a class. We got assigned to an editing class. And he was so friendly and so funny. Ricardo Palacio was a classmate at Columbia College. He would become a friend and a collaborator. He had long, like, long grungy hair and he had Hawaiian shirts and shorts. And and that's how he'd show up to class, with sandals and shorts and Hawaiian shirts. And uh, he always was very laid back, like, hey, dude, you know, like very, but always friendly, always polite, always respectful. Marcos Soriano was also a classmate and future collaborator. We were doing a, an editing class together. And, uh, you know, re- in reality, me and Ricardo were the ones doing the editing. Freddie just stood around and told us stories and made us laugh. Soriano recently completed a feature length tribute to Freddie's career, a documentary called Regardless that includes footage of the first time Freddie took the stage. Hi, my name's Fred. Hi, Fred. When he started out doing comedy, his comedy was kind of more off the wall and offbeat. Um, he had like this bizarre kind of druggy kind of vibe. Um, and then at some point, you know, somebody, I think just from doing it enough, he, re- he realized the stuff about when he would mention his family would get the best laughs, get the best response, and that that was, should be the focus of his act. When we went out to the club and we saw him perform, it was like seeing someone who you had always seen a certain way in their true element, like seeing a fish in water. After about two years on the open mic circuit, Freddie left film school to focus on stand-up. My third year of uh, film school, right at the end, they said, look, if you're going to go into the fourth year, we need you to have a B average or above. And I go, oh, you know, a C is good. Uh, it's, it's a lot better than I did in high school. And they said, look, you're never going to make it as a stand-up comedian. So just get a job. Do the right thing. And when I heard that, I said, uh, you made my choice for me. And I walked out of college to become a stand-up comedian. Went to the comedy store and got my job as a doorman. It was a good seven years of paying dues, uh, mop and puke, uh, stacking chairs. I was a limo driver for Mitzi Shore, the owner of the comedy store, who gave me my biggest break. As he developed professionally, his act was built largely around his experiences growing up in El Paso, experiences that translated to success on stage. This is where he belonged, was to do comedy. And when he walked on that stage, People came from everywhere just to watch him. Mom, but my eye still hurts. All right, mijo, don't worry. Mira, sana, sana, colita de rana. Sana, sana, colita de rana. Mom, what's that supposed to do, man? 
It still hurts. <laughs> well, you're not gonna go to the doctor, cabron, all right? In terms of like stand-up, like he was a great stand-up. He was gonna be the next guy. It was like George Lopez, you know, Paul Rodriguez, Carlos Mencia, Freddie. Like that was, at the time, that's how things worked. I was his feature for a long time. A lot of great people featured for Freddy. So we had Sebastian featuring for him, yeah. me featuring for him, uh, Renazizi, Simone. Like he had a lot of, uh, I mean, he was such a cool guy to be around. He was such a fun person. Um, I learned a lot from Freddy Soto. Al Madrigal's career has gone from television to film to becoming the co-founder of a podcasting network. He credits much of his success on stage to the lessons he learned during the lean years with Freddie. Freddie Soto took me under his wing immediately upon meeting him. It was his first weekend headlining at the San Francisco Punchline, just as an out of LA headliner. So he was just venturing out to do the SF Punch. And then we had two weekends back to back. So they put me with him as his opener on uh, a week in San Francisco, and then we went to Sacramento, and I worked with them another straight week. So we became fast friends immediately. Like my dad used to step on the roaches and then leave them there. I said, Dad, what are you doing, man? How come you leave them there? Huh? So the other ones know what's waiting for them. Huh? Come out and look at your friend. Let's go. By the early 2000s, Freddie's career had started to take off. His act had become laser focused on his family, specifically his father, who was the source of Freddie's hilarious refrain. Regardless. My dad comes up with some shit, man. He's got like his favorite English word. He says for everything, eh? Regardless. He doesn't know what it means. He just likes to say it, eh? And the whole, regardless. Speaking of which, I've got this. He used to sell these regardless bumper stickers. Like this cost probably cost a nickel to make. He'd sell it for a dollar. <laughs> it was really all about what he lived in our home. You know how it was at home, and the stuff that we did, and uh, the crazy things that my husband did and said all the time. <laughs> Anna says her husband loved that he was a major source of inspiration for Freddie's act. We would just laugh our heads off, you know, it would be so, because it was, he was just, and then so many people, would, is it really true that this happened and this happened? Yeah, it's all true. Of course he embellished, yeah. but they are real situations that happened all the time. I'm like, Dad, how's Uncle Rudy? <laughs> No, well, he, he got the herpes. Said he got the herpes? How do you get that? Well, you know, he got it. That's how you get it. You know, the, the joke about the, her, the herpes? What do you mean he paid for it? Tell me, what, how'd he get it? Well, I'm telling you, did he get a hooker? Hookers, what are you talking about hookers? No, listen to me, the herpes on his head. Herpes, herpes, herpes. Because <laughs> my husband, you know, didn't say a lot of words right, so instead of instead of hair piece he was saying herpes and so freddie got that joke from there and yeah he he wore a hair piece in 2002 freddie became a father corey gave birth to their daughter cruz and corey remembers it as a wonderful time oh. meantime freddie's comedy continued to evolve dad look at the baby she's running around you wanted to have a baby <laughs> Now you're gonna see what it's like. Now you're gonna see what I got to deal with. Oh my God, I'm lying. Give me money, daddy. I want five dollars and sixteen dollars. Hey man, you're holding a grudge, bro. What's it? Remember taking the kids to Disneyland? I pull up at, he picks me up at 9 a.m opens the center console and it's a 12 pack of cold Bud Light. And I'm like, it's 9 a.m. He's yeah, road sodas, man. Like, let's go Disneyland with the kids. Of course, we're gonna drink six Bud Lights each as we drive down there. Things were going well. After he was signed to a major talent agency, Freddie went on to make a pilot for UPN, 
with a script that was based largely on his family. Freddy, maybe you forget, but this apartment is above my garage, which is attached to my house. Remember, it's my house regardless. Well, technically, it's still the bank's house regardless. They had somebody playing uh, my husband. They had somebody playing me, my daughter. And it, w it was funny. It was really good. And, and the name of it was Freddy. It's hard to overstate how important that show would have been to Freddy's career. It wasn't picked up, but if it had, it would have predated the George Lopez show by two years. It would have been a Latino-based family featured prominently on network television. Freddy was around in a time where you could do Tonight Show sets, Letterman sets. Um, that led to TV success, and hopefully you got the sitcom, and you did The Road, and you know, you're out, but that... Um, you only can do that for so long before it really swallows you up. He later made another pilot for CBS. That show also did not get picked up. Those were setbacks, to be sure. But Freddie's stand-up never faltered. He had a special on Comedy Central. He appeared alongside Tia Leone and Adam Sandler in the 2004 movie Spanglish. Sure. Oh, sure, forever. He was part of the Three Amigos tour with Carlos Mencia and Pablo Francisco. This feature-length film of that tour was released by Miramax in 2005. What's up? What is up, Texas? Over the years, I've also collected stories about Freddie. Freddie was great, man. He, the authenticity of his act was uh, hilarious. Even off stage, he was like kind of, he was always here, what's up, bro? How you doing, yeah, bro? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, okay, bro. And uh, really positive, and uh, you know, he had his daughter and stuff, and I'm, I haven't talked to them since then. I, you know, Al Magic Al keeps in touch with them, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna make sure that when I get out, you know, from here in El Paso, because I was thinking about Freddie when we were driving by his house, I was going, that's where Freddie. Yeah, but uh, God bless him, and we're gonna, hopefully we'll see him again. I mean, obviously, he would have been the biggest thing today. Freddie was, and I, I'm not, I would say this even if he was alive today, probably one of the best live performers I'd ever seen in my whole entire life. I mean, he, he was so authentically him, and the way he would talk about his family, I've never seen anyone connect with an audience the way he did. I mean, he would crush. Bobby Lee has gone on to become an actor, a podcast star, and a national touring comic. But he was an unknown, along with Freddie, when both were working as doormen at the comedy store in the late 90s. Not, I mean, the jokes were good, but he was so real when he would talk about his dad mm -hmm. and his family that it would, it was transform, it would transform an, an audience. On July 10th, 2005, Freddie played to a sold out room here at the Laugh Factory on Sunset Boulevard. People who were there that night say that he walked off stage to a standing ovation. But that would have been the last time that Freddie performed. He died later that night. Freddie was only 35 years old. The official cause of death, a lethal combination of alcohol and prescription pills, including Xanax and fentanyl. Your children bring you the most beautiful moments of your life, and then they can bring you the most tragic moments. And you know, that's that's what's so sad. He would have become a he would have been a legend, and he's just one of the biggest losses as I see it in terms of comedy. Um, he was a great guy, and, and, and um, yeah, man, it was like, it's shattering. Yeah, it's like all these guys passing away, especially Freddie. It's like, I have uh, definitely spent a way more time at home and, you know, really um, spending as much time with my kids as I possibly can. Because you get, you don't know uh, if it's taught me anything when, you know, your last day is going to be. You know, my husband was never the same after he passed away. After um, Freddie passed away, he, it was just never the same. And, uh, of course, I was never the same either, but I think that he was 
you know, I mean, I could see that he just didn't have that spark in him anymore that, that Freddie ignited because, you know, Freddie's routine was so much about him. His father, Alfredo Soto Sr., died on Freddie's birthday in 2009 after a two-year battle with cancer. They're both buried side by side at Mount Carmel Cemetery in El Paso. There's been plenty of speculation about what could have led to Freddie's untimely death. Why did he end up joining the likes of so many other young comics who died prematurely? Were the pills and the drinking a result of dissatisfaction with his career? Was he depressed or distraught? Or was it the demons of addiction that had been there all along? All of those possible explanations seem to matter less and less the more that time goes on. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the comic strip on Saturday night for this very special event. At the El Paso comic strip, the legend of Freddy Soto serves as inspiration to a new generation of comics. Please, a big, big comic strip welcome for Nico Ajemian. And then the bartender at the show was like, my dealer's a midget. I didn't even ask that, man. And now I have so many questions. Like, your dealer's a midget? Are his prices half off? Does he ever short you? He was not my generation of comic. I was a lot younger when I saw him. I was probably 12 when I, when I first saw some of the things he did. But as a comedian now in El Paso, there is nobody to look up to more than Freddy Soto of who made it from this city and carries this city's name kind of attached to him. And for that, I will always look up to him and hold him real special in my heart. Comic strip owner Bart Reed has been in business for more than 30 years. He's seen comics come and go, but he says Freddy was something special. He was like the El Paso guy. When I, when I would watch him, I mean, I would just think he's like so many guys that I met here. He's one of those guys, and it just likable, fun, you want to be around, you're drawn to him. And yeah, on stage, it was the same thing. The, the guy just, the minute he went up there, they loved him. And, you know, his best days were way ahead of him. That's the sad thing. Back at the comedy store, the Freddy stories continue. There was a picture I was looking for, I couldn't find it. And uh, from Crest Hill. Oh, I is that the one where, where he's grabbing your crotch? Uh -huh. Yeah, I have that somewhere. Freddie talked me into it. Freddie would torture me. You gotta go down there, you gotta go down there. I'm doing little bumps. It's like an 11 hour bus ride from El Paso. That's the only place you can do a show on a Tuesday, pick up a girl on Tuesday, do a thousand dirty things with her on Friday. She comes back and introduces you to her husband. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Meet my husband, you're like, <laughs> Enough time has passed. You can tell by the way that reverence is woven into the laughter in these backstage hallways. Oh, I was sending them nudes, everything. <laughs> Near the ticket window, Freddie's headshot at the comedy store is a lot like his headstone in El Paso's Lower Valley. To some, it's just an anonymous face among many. To others, it's something much more meaningful. He was respected by everybody. Everybody could see his talent, but I wanted to make sure everybody knew how kind he was. Kind. As for Corey, she's remained focused on raising her daughter, who shares many of her father's best traits. It's almost like I, I just looped her in on what life was like with him, and so she has his sense of humor because even without him being here, because I, I fed her all the lines, right? So, but she's, she's so funny. She's so funny. She makes me laugh so hard. For Ricardo and Marcos, they're keeping Freddie's legacy alive through the documentary, which should be released later this year. Because he's been gone long enough that a lot of the younger comics don't know who he is or, or know what he was about. So being able to show them the full picture of who he was, not only as a comic, but as a, as a person. And because that's the thing that really shines through in the documentaries that I interviewed 
like 30, 40 people and nobody had a single bad word to say about this guy. I remember him as, you know, um, a giving person. A person giving of himself and he loved making people laugh. Freddie is still making people laugh. His act lives on, on the internet. And in July of this year, Corey released a new collection of Freddie's stand-up comedy on iTunes. And his spirit lives on in back hallways or through the people he touched during his brief time in the limelight. The coroner called me and he, right after Freddie died, and he said, you know, we're in Los Angeles, we're trained in Western medicine. And he said, but a lot of us in, in, the, in the morgue business and, in in, you know, we've really adopted an Eastern philosophy. And he said, he goes, matter can't be created or destroyed, so your soul is energy. And our bodies are just merely receivers, like a really intricate, fancy receivers. And sometimes, like a piece of equipment, it'll break down. But that doesn't mean that the signal isn't still coming to Earth. And so, Freddie, he said, your husband was not finished doing what he needed to do. His body gave out. And he said, he goes, that's the tragedy. He said, but his signal is still being transmitted. And he said, it's the job of the people that are left behind to turn their signals and receive that. I like to think that, it makes me feel better. Why do you gotta make it racial, dude? Cause it's fucking funny. <laughs> That's all we've got, man, is who we are and what we were, man. You gotta know where you came from to know where you're going, bro. bit that he did is the bit of the roof because there's the part where your husband says, oh, but for Charlie, <laughs> right. that is the funniest thing for me. <laughs> oh, oh, but if it was your friends that you got drunk with, oh, oh, I found it. Because there's something about the name Charlie that he said, <laughs> Charlie, it's just so yeah. Good. Oh, let me look harder for you, Charlie. Look, I found it. I love you, Charlie. Let's go get drunk and pee on my dad.